Please welcome David Rubenstein, President of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we are having our 18th virtual signature event of our 35th season, and we are very fortunate to have two special guests who have been in, in the news recently for a lot of the things they're doing, and I, they have many things to talk about today that I think you'll find quite interesting. Uh, the first will be Dr. Rochelle Walensky. She's the Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, as it's often known. Uh, she is a person who um, has assumed this position at the beginning of the uh, uh, administration of President Biden, and I will introduce her appropriately in a few moments. And we also have the mayor of the District of Columbia, Muriel Bowser. Um, mayor Bowser has been a guest of ours before, and she has a lot of things to talk about today that she's uh, been dealing with in terms of our health situation in the district. So I want to welcome both of them here. So let me first introduce our, our guest, uh, Rochelle Walensky. Rochelle has the distinction of being the first person who has ever spoken at the Economic Club of Washington as a guest whose father was a member of the Economic Club and still is. Ed Bursoff was one of the early members of the Economic Club, and he's still a member. And uh, I want to thank Ed for making certain that we we're able to get his daughter to come here. Um, Rochelle Walensky grew up in the Washington area. She is a graduate of Winston Churchill High School, Washington University, Johns Hopkins Medical School, and the, the, Fair, the, the School of Public Health at Harvard University. Until she assumed the CDC position as the 19th director of the CDC, she was the chief of the division of infectious diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital. And she's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's also one of the nation's leading experts on infectious diseases, but also on HIV and AIDS, where she spent a great deal of her career. So uh, Dr. Walensky, thank you very much for making time for us today. Thank you so thank much, you. it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, is the worst of the pandemic behind us? In other words, can we say finally, the worst is behind us and we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Is it too early to say that or not? Um, you know, I, what I think is um, we have to be humble with this virus. Uh, we, we have said before we thought we were through it that the spring would be um, a good time last year and that summer we wouldn't have any more surges. So on the one hand, I think we have to be humble. On the other hand, um, I am really cautiously optimistic. Our case rates are coming down. Our um, vaccine rates are going up. Um, Having a vaccine here is really, really critical as we as we look into what the future world holds. Um, I do uh, think about variants a lot. Um, I, variants do serve to potentially threaten our vaccine efforts um, coming from from other places. Um, but I would like to say, with cautious optimism, that um, I would that I'm hopeful that the worst is behind us. So I think we have about 150 million people that have been vaccinated already in the United States, but we have 331 million people, so less than half, really. So how are we going to get the other half vaccinated? And do we need to get the other half vaccinated to get so-called herd immunity? So first, I'll just highlight an important step that happened yesterday. So yesterday, the CDC um, approved through the ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, what um, FDA had authorized on Monday, which was that we have now a vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. This expands the pool of eligible people by 17 million, which I think is great. We still do not have a vaccine that is authorized for children less than 15. Um, so that is a pool we can't vaccinate quite yet. I think your point is actually a really good one though, that we have um, hard work ahead. We um, have vaccinated about 44% of people who are over the age of um, 18, about 35% of the entire population Population. And we knew late April, early May, we'd hit this inflection point, this point where people would not be flocking in to get vaccine. And we now needed to do the hard work um, with vaccine available of getting to people who might be hesitant for one reason or another. Well, many people just seem to not want to get a vaccine. Either they're just afraid of having a jab in their arm or they just think that they're the government, they don't trust the government or whatever re reason they have. Are, do you, how much do you need to get vaccinated? What percentage of the population so we can feel we have so-called herd immunity? And you can explain what herd immunity really is. So, so herd immunity, interestingly, was not a term that anybody was really bouncing around before the pandemic. Herd immunity is actually an epidemiologic term, which is defined as one minus one over R naught where R naught is the transmissibility of the virus, of whatever disease you're trying to reach herd immunity. Practically, that means that you need to have enough people immunized in a population so that if a virus, or, or immune in a population, so the, if a virus was going to hit the next person, that they would stop the train of transmission because they were immune. 
Um, the challenge is that with our variants, we have had increased transmissibility of the virus. So pinning what exactly the number is for herd immunity changes if we have a more transmissible virus. And so, you know, I think people generally believe we need to get to somewhere between 70 and 80 percent in order to reach herd immunity. I think the other thing that's really, really important is to recognize that um, the country is not homogeneous that um, on average 70 to 80 percent would be great but if you have communities that are 40 50 percent you don't have herd community uh, herd immunity in that community and in fact you the virus is an opportunist so that's where the virus will surge well, let's suppose for the 12 to 15 year olds by the way for people under the age of 12 there hasn't been enough testing yet is that right but you when do you expect you'll have tests so that five-year-olds six-year-olds seven-year-olds can get can get the vaccine so they do it stepwise downward. So we, we were at 16 and 17, then we went down to 12 to 15, and now they'll go down to nine, they'll go down to six. We're hoping that by the end, by the late fall, we'll have data down to nine, and I believe down to six, and, and perhaps ability to use it at the tail end of 21, if not early 22. Okay. So let's suppose I'm 14 years old and I want to get the vaccine, but my mother or father say they don't want me to do it. Can I show up and get my vaccine? Do I have to have parental permission to get it or how does that work? So that actually is a state by state law. The federal government does not um, actually uh, govern over what um, what kind of consent or assent you need um, for these teenagers. Those are state by state laws. So I would say each person has to go to their state. Many places will say your parent doesn't need to be there, but your parent needs to have information or your parent needs to have signed off. Um, so it really does vary by state. If you're looking for vaccine, um, you can text your zip code into GetVax or 438829, and you will get a list of five places around you that have vaccine available. Okay, I've gotten uh, two shots of Moderna. Um, do, I need a boost, do, do I need a booster shot ever? We don't know. Um, so, you know, what we are following, right, first of all, I should mention, and, and this has been a source of confusion, so I think it's really important to understand, if you've gotten your two shots of Moderna, you're protected right now. So it's not that you need a booster to protect you now. The real question is how long will your immunity last? And so we're doing those studies right now to see if immunity wanes, if immunity wanes, particularly in um, frailer populations, older populations that might at uh, long-term care facilities and things like that. And we wanna be prepared. So we are working now with the um, companies to ensure that we have boosters available if they are needed and when they are needed. The other question that comes up a lot with regard to boosters is, can you now get your booster as Pfizer, right? If you got two doses of Moderna, what can you get your booster as Pfizer? Those studies are ongoing as well. Now, some people have gotten one shot and they haven't gotten the second shot and maybe they're not gonna get it. What happens to them? Do they have a little bit of immunity or not that much? Um, first of all, I would encourage everybody to get the second shot of their two shot vaccine, of their two dose vaccine. Um, what we know is the first shot is likely not as durable, it's likely not as protective, and um, it probably doesn't have the breadth of coverage that we would really like to see for all of the variants out there. So it, it boosts your, your, um, your response, it makes it more durable, and it probably makes, gives you a broader breadth of, of being able to cover the variants we have. Now, when you get a shot, your arm hurts for a while. Uh, why is that? So that's really your immune system. It's your arm hurting. It's your, um, my joints hurt a little bit. I had a little bit of aches and fevers. Um, so that's really your immune system revving up, kicking in and, and um, creating the response as if it sees this foreign thing. It's pretending it's, your body is pretending it's seeing a virus, right? It's, it's making that immune reaction to the virus or the, the mock virus, the vaccine, um, so that it will be ready to rev up again should it actually see the virus. But I didn't, I got my arm hurt, but after that, I didn't feel any, I didn't have any chills. I didn't, I didn't know whether it was really working or not. So how do I know whether it really took? You know, we don't really have a good sense. Whether or not you get symptoms is not really a good marker of how well you are protected. So some people get the symptoms, some people don't. And let's talk about masks. Um, I know you've, <laughs> my favorite uh, subject. <laughs> you've testified a little bit about masks. So what is the story on masks? Now that I've been vaccinated, do I need to wear a mask in my house? Do I need to wear a mask in a restaurant? What's the story in your view? So we are looking at the data really carefully and um, we have to look at sort of three general things. One is um, how, uh, how much disease is out there in the community? Um, how, you know, how much, uh, 
how much disease is out there, how many people are being able to be, uh, have been vaccinated. Two is, is vaccine available to people in the community? And increasingly now we have widespread eligibility since April 19th. We have availability now for 12 to 15 year olds. And essentially we have enough vaccine that if you want a vaccine, you can get it. And then the third really important thing is where is the science right now? And we're looking at this really carefully. There are several things that I feel like we need in the science to be able to say we can take off our masks. One is, um, does the vaccine work in the public the way it does in clinical trials? People who are eligible and work in clinical or, and, and uh, enroll in clinical trials are sometimes different kinds of people, the selective kinds of people, they're healthier people. What are the data that say that it works in the real world and not just in clinical trials? Second is what are the data that say it works against the variants that we have out there circulating in this country right now? And third is, um, and this the trials did not assess, if you um, are vaccinated, what is the chance that you could potentially have asymptomatic disease and still give it to somebody else? And so there's evolving science in all of those areas and we're looking at it really carefully and we're really hoping to update our mass guidance soon. All right, but right now, um, do you think if, I, if I've been vaccinated, what is your recommendation if I'm uh, going to a restaurant? Do I, should I wear a mask when I'm not eating or what should I be doing? Our current guidance says you, um, if you're outdoors and you're vaccinated, then you can um, take off your mask. Um, and we are looking to update our mask guidance soon with regard to other indoor settings. And how far apart should you stay from somebody else if your, your mask is off? Should it be three feet, six feet, 10 feet? If you're vaccinated and outside, um, you do need that distance. Our current guidance, if you're vaccinated, um, is that you wear your mask, but you also need not distance. Now, what I do wanna say is this is all for vaccinated. And if you are not vaccinated, we still have the, the guidance that says, wear your mask, maintain your distance, and most importantly, get vaccinated. All right, but let's suppose I'm meeting somebody, I'm wearing a mask and I go to, uh, should I shake their hand? Can I, is it okay to shake somebody's hand? How do you know if they're really vaccinated when you go meet them for the first time? Yeah, you know, if you don't have the knowledge of whether somebody or not is vaccinated, you know, I would say that our, our, our um, you know, it's really about individual risk at this point. Um, and so, you know, if you want to shake their hand, I might cure out afterwards. Um, really, we're going back to the basic principles of if you don't know, then probably right. best to wash right. your hands, wear your mask, distance. I don't think it's insulting to shake somebody's hand and to take out the Purell and wash your hands right away in front of them. That doesn't look bad. <laughs> I have to say, I've been doing a lot of elbow bumping. <laughs> okay. okay. And if somebody wants to kiss you on the cheek, what do you do? You just turn around or you just say, don't do that anymore? <laughs> yeah, that might be evolving as this pandemic evolves. <laughs> so for the rest of my life, should I take my vaccination card and keep it in my wallet? So how do I, if I, somebody says to me, are you vaccinated? I say, yes. Sometimes they say, well, well prove it. What am I supposed to do? Um, you know, this I think is going to be an evolving area. The federal government has not um, has not uh, is not planning on weighing in with regard to vaccine passports. Um, really, a lot of discussion about whether um, whether and how we make sure that verification of vaccination is is um, equitable, right? That if you have it on your phone, what if everybody doesn't have a phone? If it's on an app, what if everybody doesn't have an app? The crossing the digital divide. So there's a lot of active work in this area um, with regard to both travel and, and other places that might do it for business purposes and whatnot. Okay, so um, let's talk about for a moment um, the CDC. We didn't really talk about it. Uh, everybody's heard of the CDC, but what really is it? And why is it in Atlanta? Why is it in Washington, D.C.? So the CDC is the nation's public health protection agency. Um, and it's not really just for the nation, it's for across the world. Um, the CDC this year will be celebrating its 75th anniversary. It was originally established to try and stomp out a potential malaria threat that was happening in Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, and uh, it's in Atlanta because of the work that was going on there at the time and because Emory actually sold um, a piece of land to the CDC, to the federal government to establish the CDC. It's on essentially Emory property um, at the time. And that's really where we've grown and flourished. And how many employees do you have at the CDC? How big is it? Um, it's about 12,000 employees and then an additional 12,000 contractors. Okay. And um, let me ask you about uh, what your authority is. When you say this is the CDC policy, you don't have policemen to enforce it or anything. You just can kind of make recommendations to people. You just can't, you don't enforce anything. Is that right? 
That's it. So we make public health recommendations. And, you know, while everybody is sort of focused hard on our public health recommendations for um, for what we say about COVID and summer camps and schools and, and cruise ships and all sorts of things, um, what I really want to articulate is wearing my prior hat as a as an infectious disease doc, I have been going to the CDC guidance for, for my entire career about what vaccines you should get when you travel to X foreign country, or how do you quarantine somebody who's had the measles, or what do you do about directly observed therapy in tuberculosis? So we in infectious disease and truly in public health have been going to a huge menu of CDC guidance um, for many, many infectious and non-infectious diseases. Um, let's suppose I was offered the chance to get the Russian Sputnik vaccine or the Chinese one. Uh, should I take those? Are they as good or you don't know? Um, you know, I haven't seen any published data on those and I don't believe those two yet are WHO approved. Um, I would have to confirm that, but um, I would stick to either something that is FDA approved or WHO approved or authorized, I should say. Okay, um, these vaccines were produced in less than a year. Normally it takes four to seven years at least to get a vaccine. If we didn't have so-called messenger RNA and those kind of synthetic techniques, would we have a vaccine now if we use the traditional um, vaccine methods or are we just fortunate that we have these methods now? So um, yes is the answer. So um, the J&J &J vaccine is actually not an mRNA vaccine. It's an adenovirus vector vaccine as is the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, not yet approved here, but used in many countries around the world. So um, it is the case that we've been able to have vaccines pretty quickly. I wanna be really clear about how quickly these were developed. Um, because the mRNA technology has been studied for decades. Um, we were able to make these vaccines and do the, the trials quickly for numerous reasons, but, but, and we were able to leverage the science at a really critically important point. But the reason we were able to do this so quickly is because the science was primed and ready to go. We overlapped in our, in our um, we were able to like, remove the dead time in our, um, in our phase one, two, three trials. We manufactured the vaccine at risk, meaning that we did it while the trials were enrolling. And in fact, the trial endpoints at the time they were enrolling were pretty easy to reach because we had so much disease. Now, is there a White House coronavirus task force now? Is there a White House task force on this? Um, I don't know, I, I believe so. Yeah, I, I don't know that it officially, yeah, I guess so. I guess we officially like, have that name. We certainly are a team that meets often. <laughs> How do you, how do you, who do you make your recommendations to? You, re, you report directly to the HHS secretary or how does that work? I do. I report directly to um, Secretary Becerra and he's been wonderful. Um, and I also, um, so, so, you know, I look to my agency. We have extraordinary subject matter experts in so many different areas. So I look to my agency about this and the subject matter experts and scientists there as to how um, science will evolve. Um, I then, you know, present to the secretary to make sure he agrees. I also bring in, I have uh, sort of what we call the white coats around the table. So I'll talk to, to uh, Dr. Fauci, I'll talk to the Surgeon General, I'll talk to um, Bashar Shukar, who is the, you know, uh, COVID task force. So we, uh, or the COVID um, uh, liaison at the White House. So we, we spend a lot of time just chatting with each other, thinking about what are the next big things that we need to be conquering? What are things that are, you know, concerning to us? We all have different outreach, which has been really, really helpful. Have you talked to, met with President Biden? I have. I have. I, we meet with him about weekly. Okay. And so he uh, wears a mask a lot. People sometimes ask him, why are you still wearing a mask? You're vaccinated. Why do you think he still should wear a mask if you do think that? You know, I think um, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with in what setting he is and in what setting he isn't. I know he was, um, there was some discussion about how he wore it outside when our guidance has changed and he didn't. Um, I will say that sometimes when I am walking from one place to another, um, I don't take off my mask. It's kind of a habit at this point. Um, but so I think as more and more of us are, as the guidance is evolving, as more and more of us are getting more comfortable now taking our mask off, which we've been spending the next last year and a half doing, uh, putting our mask on, I think people, will, their behaviors will change. Now, do you think CDC should be independent of any government uh, cabinet department? So it's been criticized during the previous administration for being maybe politically pressured. Uh, do you, have you felt any political pressure to come up with any answers or anything? 
I made it pretty clear before I took this job that the science was going to lead, that the subject matters were going to lead. Um, I have not felt any political pressure. Um, certainly, there's a lot of, of um, stakeholders who, who are impacted by our change in guidance, but I have felt completely independent to make sure that the science is what guides the guidance. What about schools? Do you think schools can open safely and do teachers have to be vaccinated? And if the young children are not vaccinated, is that okay for the teachers? So um, I'm really pleased that in March, we had a big rollout of getting teachers vaccinated um, through our federal retail pharmacy program. Um, about 80%, the, the surveys have suggested that about 80% of our teachers and educators have taken, have chosen to be vaccinated. They've all at least gotten one shot and I'm hopeful they'll follow up with the second and we'll get um, closer to 100% there. Um, I think schools, we should all plan for schools to be open in full, in person come the fall. Um, not everybody has been able to, not every school has been able to do that until now, but I think that um, by the fall, we should absolutely be there. Whether they require vaccination for, <coughs> excuse me, for teachers, um, that I think is going to be at the jurisdictional level. That's not something that we at CDC are going to regulate, but certainly the more people who are vaccinated, the less risk there will be. What about summer camps? Are they okay to go to summer camps now? Um, so we clearly have to revise our summer camp guidance in lieu of what happened yesterday with our CDC vaccination policy for our CDC vaccination for availability for 12 to 15 year olds. And we're actively in the process of doing that now. OK. And so your predecessor said after he left office that he thought that the uh, virus was uh, came from an, a lab in Wuhan. Um, is there any evidence of that or do you guys an expert in this area? What do you think about that chance of that happening, having happened? So the WHO has engaged in a, a report. Um, we've been looking at that report and numerous experts have been looking at that report. The data from that report do not, um, are not definitive and they're not wholly transparent in terms of our being able to evaluate the individual line, line data, it's sort of a summary of data. We have encouraged, and I believe the, C, the um, WHO is engaging in a second phase of that report where we really um, are encouraging uh, transparency and open access to the data so that scientists here can evaluate that. But your thinking is it's less likely or more likely? We just don't know yet whether- I don't think we yet know, um, but the, w the initial WHO report suggested it was less likely. So I know you don't spend 99% of your time on this issue. Uh, what else do you work on other than this issue? I know you've got a lot of other diseases you work on. What's your second or third biggest disease you're working on? Well, so I think my responsibility as leading the CDC right now is to make sure that we as a country get out of this pandemic. Um, so I have been spending an extraordinary amount of time on that issue specifically. Um, I have also spent a lot of time in, in um, addressing health equity. Um, that has come up time and time again. It's, it's obvious with regard to who got disease, who died from disease, who is getting vaccinated. So we are spending a lot of time on health equity. And I think really now is the moment to make sure that we address health equity in this country, not just for COVID, but for all underlying chronic diseases. We know that most infectious diseases actually have a dispar uh, disproportional hit to, um, to vulnerable communities. So we're spending a lot of time um, working toward a health equity strategy. And then I'm spending quite a bit of time in trying to mobilize resources for our uh, public health infrastructure in this country. I think we can all recognize that we as a public health infrastructure were too frail and, and not prepared, too thin to handle a pandemic like this. Um, I think public health works for us when we don't know that it's working. Um, so while we have been handling this pandemic, I will say we've had um, a measles case, we've had two outbreaks of Ebola, we've had Legionnaires, we've had salmonella, all happening while everybody is working on COVID-19. We've been able to handle that. But we as a public health infrastructure really need a more robust workforce. We need a um, data monitorization, which has really been um, lacking, as well as um, monitorization of our public health labs. Okay, I'm always worried I'm gonna get some disease. So uh, what should I most be worried about? If I'm not worried about the virus now, what's, what should I, I'm not gonna get Ebola, I assume, I hope, but uh, what, what, should I worry about the flu? Should I get a flu shot? You should most definitely get a flu shot. So we were all very worried last year that if we had a bad flu season, 
concomitant with a bad uh, COVID season that really we were gonna um, have real uh, increased mortality related to flu because we didn't have resources. Um, we didn't have a bad flu season. We actually had quite a good flu season last year. Um, and that's probably because we were all wearing masks and all the mitigation strategies that work for COVID also work for flu. But what that means is we're actually pretty vulnerable to a bad flu season in the year ahead. And so we are really asking everybody to make sure that they get a flu shot this year. Okay, and uh, what about AIDS? You're an expert on AIDS and HIV. Is AIDS uh, still a growing problem in the United States or it's growing more outside the United States and in the United States now, HIV you know, AIDS? HIV and AIDS is still a, um, a challenging issue both in this country and outside of this country. There's an active HIV outbreak uh, happening right now in West Virginia uh, in, among people who use drugs. Um, still one in seven people who have HIV do not know they have HIV. We really have a unique moment where we right now actually have the, the toolkit, the strategies, the treatment and the prevention interventions to really end the HIV epidemic. And so we are working that as, as um, that is high on my priority list to do in this country. And then of course, around the world, um, this is still one of the leading causes of death uh, around the world. Um, and CDC is actively working in getting um, prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV efforts, as well as HIV um, treatment across the globe. Now you have three teenage boys, I believe. Um, if they don't wear their mask, does somebody call up you and say, you're, you know, <laughs> Your, your children, you know, the mother is the head of the CDC and they're not doing the right thing. You ever get those calls or you tell your sons, be careful? <laughs> Could you imagine what it's like to be my poor kid? <laughs> so any, um, any, I haven't had too many calls telling on them, but but they know they're going to be. <laughs> any, any regrets about taking this job? No, it's been, I was told ahead of time it would be extraordinarily hard. Um, it's true. It's extraordinarily hard, but no regrets at all. Dr. Walensky, I want to thank you very much for interesting conversation and uh, keep up the great work, okay? Thank you so much for having me. Bye. So now I would like to have a discussion with the mayor of the District of Columbia, Muriel Bowser. Um, mayor Bowser, uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. So Mayor Bowser, I think everybody knows she's been with us several times. Uh, she was first elected in 2014, now in her second term. And uh, she was previously a member of the city council, first elected in 2007, if I recall. And um, Mayor Bowser, you have made some news recently about uh, changes in our policy in the District of Columbia. Can you tell us what the big news is? Well, um, thanks for having me, David. And it was great listening to Dr. Walensky. Uh, I will say that the news is that DC residents and businesses are crushing this virus. Um, we're driving down our case rates, driving down our hospitalizations and heeding um, public health guidance. Uh, and so that has put us in the position uh, to turn on activity in DC. We're gonna have a big turn up on May 21st uh, and we will continue that on June 11th. Uh, the big focus for us uh, is to listen to the CDC's risk guidance um, in for individuals to make decisions. First of all, to get vaccinated. Uh, we know that vaccinated people uh, can safely participate in a full range of activities uh, and uh, to wear your mask. And so that is gonna allow us to get the city back open and to get people um, back to some semblance of their normal lives. Um, but it also puts a focus on uh, vaccination, um, because you can safely uh, participate in a lot of activities um, with vaccination. Okay, so um, when June 11th comes around, will people be able to basically go back to normal life in terms of going to a restaurant? And when you go to the restaurant, do you wear a mask still or not? You still wear a, a mask, uh, and we're going to closely follow the CDC's recommendations on, on mask wearing. Okay, and... Uh, how much has the economy of the District of Columbia been hurt by the pandemic? I assume many things have been closed and so forth. Do you have any way of measuring how bad the economy has been hit? Uh, well, we, we, our economy is resilient, uh, but certainly we are a, uh, we are a hospitality town uh, and we want to get our travelers back. Uh, before the pandemic, David, we had 20 million people um, coming to the District of Columbia annually to visit. We're a food town, uh, so over the years, we've had a burgeoning restaurant scene. 
Uh, and I have to tell you how proud I am of these entrepreneurs who have pivoted, who have been creative, who have kept their uh, employees um, on the job in many cases. Uh, and but they have taken a substantial hit. Our large venues, uh, our you know arts and culture scene, as well as our sports scene, have all been impacted. Uh, and so we see those activities uh, slowly coming, uh, slowly coming back. And uh, we're very grateful for that. But that has been a significant hit uh, on our economy. Part of the economy has been uh, very damaging to people in the lower economic uh, stratas. And uh, obviously, you can see in some parts of D.C., um, people in homeless tents. And um, is homelessness increased dramatically? And what can be done about it? Homelessness has not increased um, dramatically. Uh, in fact, what we reported was a pretty significant uh, decrease in family homelessness. Uh, over the course of my tenure, we've actually seen those numbers go down over 40%. Uh, we have uh, had a smaller and much smaller increase, I mean, decrease in single homelessness. Um, and then we're looking at chronic homelessness uh, for people who are, you know, who have uh, interacted with this system over and over. Uh, we see a slight increase. Certainly what we see with uh, tents uh, is more a visible problem for people who are unhoused. Um, but we do have shelter and we have shelter available. So we're working double hard um, to get uh, those people uh, in shelter. So in the District of Columbia, um, what percentage of people in the district have been vaccinated now? Is it? Uh... We are, we're reporting over 50% of our people have um, gotten at least uh, one shot, um, which is, is, is good. Um, but it also uh, got a, you know, report the other day, it puts us in the top quartile of, uh, of states. Um, but there, there's a lot of work remaining. I just got some reports uh, from our vaccination sites of the, the 12 to 15 year old showing up and walking up to those sites, them and their parents very excited uh, to get the vaccine. Um, we're at 34, I'm looking down at a note, um, just about 35% of our people fully vaccinated. So there, there's a lot of work to do. Um, okay, um, let's talk about uh, for a moment the, uh, the police situation. Um, First, let's deal with what happened on January the 6th. The DC police came in through the rescue, I guess, is that right? Um, how did that work? Because you weren't, the DC police weren't called in initially on January 6th, but who ultimately uh, authorized them to go in to help the Capitol Police? Well, David, you know, we work in, in concert with our federal partners and that's the way we have safe events, safe protests. Uh, inaugurals, 4th of July, uh, you name it. And we work um, with a mutual aid agreement. Um, typically it's us DC police who call on our county partners and federal partners to assist on large scale events. Um, but we are also there to assist them um, when, when called. Um, and certainly the insurrection of January 6th was a uh, threat, not just to the safety of Washington DC, but uh, to our democracy. And we are very uh, interested in a uh, bipartisan or a nonpartisan uh, commission uh, to review what happened on January 6th and make sure it never happens again. I thought in the end that DC police did come and help out and you sent about 600. Not in the end, in the beginning, the yeah. middle and the end. Okay, you were there all along. Okay, yes. um, I was surprised when uh, to learn during the course of a lot of these things that the DC National Guard is, you don't, that you can't call out the DC National Guard. It's the President of the United States that calls it the DC National Guard. Is that right or wrong? No, that's actually, that's absolutely right. So in some ways, it's not really the DC National Guard, but the President's Guard. Uh, and, and, you know, and, can I you think change that or is there an effort to change that or so that you can actually there, there are a couple of efforts to change it. There's a bill um, in, in con I think in both the House and the Senate that would give the mayor uh, the same authority over the DC National Guard as the governors of the 50 states have over the DC National Guard. Um, we're also going to talk to the president about um, what he can do with executive authority uh, to to make this a more palatable situation for us. Do you have a closer relationship with President Biden than you did with President Trump? 
Um, well, I think certainly we 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 share the the love for, of our democracy, the autonomy for the District of Columbia, the the belief uh, that DC uh, should be admitted as the 51st state, uh, a reliance on science uh, to beat back this virus, uh, and to support people while we go through this, uh, you know, this hundred year pandemic. So right now, the House of Representatives has passed legislation that would. Uh, prove D.C. to be the 51st state. It's now That's in the correct. Senate. Is, is there a reasonable chance you can get 51 votes there? Uh, this is what I know. Uh, first of all, it would take 60 uh, with the current rules. Uh, and this is the best place we've ever been for the passage of D.C. statehood. Uh, we have gotten the support of our neighbors in Maryland and Virginia. Uh, we have the support of the Speaker of the House, the Leader of the Senate, the President of the United States. Uh, we have our business community uh, supporting us. The Federal City Council was very helpful in commissioning a report about the history of race in D.C. and how it has impacted our status. So we're in the best place possible. Uh, and what I also know is that our, our fellow Americans also see the impact on our democracy. So it's bigger than us in some ways. Uh, it's important for this region. I know there are a lot of members uh, that, are, that are listening from DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And for our region, it's important that we have six senators. Our four senators are great, but we need six senators to really deliver for what our region needs so that we can remain competitive. During the first stimulus bill under President Trump, I think the District of Columbia was shortchanged by roughly $700 million on a formula that had you been a state, you would have gotten, I think, the $700 million more or something like that. Did you ever get any of that money? We got it all. Um, and okay. so I want to thank um, President Biden and in congressional Democrats who really made sure that we were made whole. Senator Chris Van Hollen played a huge role okay. uh, in Senator Schumer and the Speaker of the House. Uh, to make sure that those funds were included, um, but it couldn't have happened without the support of the president. And I don't care where you come from, $755 million, three quarters of a billion dollars is a lot of money. Uh, and to be shortchanged that money on politics um, during uh, our pandemic, re pandemic response was unconscionable. So the District of Columbia in the census turned out to be one of the fastest growing parts of the United States. You grew at more than 14%. Yep. And it turns out the city is, we don't know officially, but it's more or less half white and half non-white. Is that more or less right? Um, it's more or less half black and, ha and half okay. non-black. Okay. And um, to date, um, why do you think the district has grown so much? You had, uh, you grew at 14.8%. Um, and, you know, is it because uh, people just love the District of Columbia or why do you think people are moving here? Uh, well, it's a great place to live. Uh, I would say we have great leadership here. Okay. You like that? That's a, that was a little joke. But um, I do think that people want to go places uh, where it's livable, um, a beautiful city, um, great jobs, arts and culture, um, easy access to, to other great cities uh, along the East Coast uh, as well has been helpful. Uh, it's a great place for families. Uh, it used to be, David, that people moved here. The second they had kids, they moved out. Um, but now our investments in schools and parks and recreation and public safety uh, have uh, made us a great place uh, to live and, and to do business, I might add. Now, you've recently appointed a new person to be the head of the D.C. police. I have. Right. So um, how are the DC police doing? And uh, have there been problems recently in the homicide rate in the D District of Columbia? Well, what we've seen uh, around the country and we unfortunately are experiencing it here as well as an increase while we see overall crime going down, um, violent crime unfortunately has been persistent uh, and in some cases increased, especially um, with, with shootings in concentrated areas. Uh, so we are uh, attacking it from the whole of government, uh, not just the police, uh, but I introduced a program that focuses on 150 blocks in the district uh, and focuses on the people who are most likely uh, to commit crime or be victims of crime. So it's in its early stages, 
um, but it's showing some promise on really being able to invest resources in the people who are causing um, really wreaking havoc in, in our communities. We are um, focused on policing. Uh, I think you know our council commissioned a report recently um, that recommended how to change policing uh, in the city. So we are looking at some of their recommendations as I prepare my budget. I do think mayors like me are, uh, are, are facing um, a challenge uh, in being responsive uh, to calls, calls to uh, remove police out of certain um, public safety matters, but at the same time, uh, need our forces to be robust to respond to citizen calls. So that's what we're looking at now, how to fund um, the, the necessary police force that we need. Now, you've had a fair number of police retire or, um, I guess, just quit the force because of what pressures and right. so forth, a couple hundred. So how are you going to get uh, another uh, people to replace them? Is it hard to get people to want to be a D.C. policeman? It's hard to get the council to fund replacing them. That's what I would say is our, our biggest challenge. Our attrition numbers are about 300 a year. Um, last year, um, we weren't able to hire any police officers because of defunding. Um, and so if we continue to have that challenge, having a police budget approved, uh, we could see our numbers dip um, in a very short order uh, to, to numbers that I would think are unacceptable. The reason that District of Columbia Council, District uh, Count, the City Council doesn't want to fund it is their political pressures not to fund the police or what is the reason? Um, I think that that is their uh, kind of philosophical approach to public safety in some cases. In other cases, I do think it's politics. Well, um, you have $400 million of unpaid parking tickets, as I probably said to you before, probably some are mine. But um, is there an amnesty program if people want to pay that off soon? Yes. So we are um, going into um, our, our reopening posture, not just lifting of our restrictions. Some of our public services have been modified too to keep our employees safe. Uh, and part of that modification has been parking enforcement. And uh, we're turning that back on, a word to the wise. So please mind your, um, your parking signs, get your credentials updated if you have an expired license or vehicle registration or tags, um, get those things updated, including your inspection, um, because our parking enforcement will begin in earnest uh, in June. Uh, also, um, we wanna help people out who have either racked up tickets, they, probably didn't in the last year, but they may have had some tickets going into the pandemic. They may have suffered some losses due to COVID. Uh, and we wanna help them get their credentials in order by applying for amnesty. Um, but if you don't ask, you won't get it. So please find out so how we can wipe out your, um, your fees and you can just take care of um, the underlying ticket. Okay. so. Um You've been the mayor now for about six plus years. Yep. You still enjoy the job? I love it. Um, we, we talked early on, I think, in my tenure. Right. And uh, it is, the, is the, you know, the privilege of my life to be a, my professional life, certainly uh, to be able to be mayor of my hometown. After six years, you really know how to do it. Right. Um, and when I look at my fellow mayors uh, who, are, who are in their first terms, I feel really bad for them for having a year like we had. Uh, you know, I had four, or four and a half years under my belt. Uh, and uh, the challenge of this pandemic has really changed the job. Um, so now uh, what our focus is, is on how do we bring the district back? How do we get those uh, roaring revenues and jobs and restaurants? How do we get it back? How we have a once, maybe certainly in my political lifetime, the ability to make huge investments uh, even the American Rescue Plan is allowing us to make huge human services investments. If this jobs and infrastructure plan goes through, uh, we can transform systems and really um, promote urban innovation um, that's going to change the way we live in cities. And we have to. We have to, David. I don't have to tell you that our employees and workers um, and people who live in cities have spent the last year thinking about 
you, you know, where they work, where they live, and, you know, are they going to make different choices? So cities have to be in the game uh, to keep our workers, our companies, and our residents. So um, are you, do you like the job so much you're going to say you're going to run for re-election or you haven't, not ready to say that yet? Well, th that time is coming soon, isn't it? So um, uh, we have a primary in the district um, in June. Um, I've certainly focused all my time right now on the pandemic, the response, and now reopening. Uh, and I'll turn to those um, political conversations soon. Okay. What would you say if, if in the job is the biggest challenge of the job that over the last six years has been dealing with the problems uh, associated with uh, the pandemic or uh, associated with some of the uh, protests or what would you say, or the funding issues? Um, I think that those are, those are certainly all big issues. I could point to kind of the, the battle, um, sometimes a necessary battle that we had with the, the former um, president um, that caused a lot of anxiety in the city. Managing that anxiety among our residents and businesses um, was a huge um, challenge, but I also saw it as an opportunity as the district to come to, together um, to support our values and band together around things that were important to the district. I would say the biggest challenge for, for us, however, um, a, you know, a very a thriving city, a growing city, and a prosperous city is to make sure um, that people aren't left behind in that progress. Uh, so that's why we've been very focused on economic development uh, and the creation of good paying jobs uh, and housing and affordable housing. So I think we have some opportunities coming out of this pandemic uh, to really focus on getting our folks uh, in higher paying jobs so that they can afford a good life here in DC. Now you created the Black Lives Matter Plaza uh, on 16th Street, and then I recently was sort of being paved over, I guess, a little bit or something. That's just temporary, but is it going to be permanently painted that way or something like that? How are you? It doing? is. Um, so what uh, we we created, we think, was um, a, 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 a inspirational piece of art that spoke to the time that we were in. Um, that also speaks to who we are in the nation's capital, where people come to protest and to address. Um, the federal government, uh, and Black Lives Matter um, became that. Uh, we are installing the permanent um, artwork um, today, actually, uh, and it is going to be, uh, it's going to include more lighting and landscaping in um, commemoration of the events of last June. So, uh, And it will also um, uh, permit uh, for pedestrians, um, it, for special events, and vehicular travel north and south on 16th Street. So uh, you have uh, been working to run the city as the mayor sort of remotely or in the office. How have you been managing this to do this remotely or you're in your office now, right? Have you been working out of well, your office? We, yeah, we've been in, um, in our office for most of the pandemic, my um, executive team. Um, and about 40% of DC government have reported in person throughout the pandemic. We're local government, David. So we're a city, a county and a state all at once. And um, so DC government employees uh, pick up the trash and they haven't missed uh, a week. Um, DC government employees um, run uh, various facilities, homeless shelters, we support um, you know, a hospital facility. So they've been reporting to work uh, throughout. And um, we've been communicating on almost a daily basis. So the mayor's office of communications, they probably have worked double time. Our health department is running um, this uh, response. They've worked double time. So we have been reporting um, to work uh, throughout. But are you bringing people back full time in their office by a certain date? Are you telling them to do that now? We are. We've been working on that plan uh, for several weeks, and um, I think in May and June, all of my uh, cabinet members and managers and appointees, about 4,000 staff out of our 37,000 are reporting, uh, and by June 12th, all of our employees uh, will be reporting in person. Um, we, are, we are allowing some flexibility as people phase back in. 
Uh, and so they will be reporting to the office for the majority of the week. Um, we do recognize, and this is not just for uh, you know city government operations directly, but also for our recruitment and retention efforts, uh, that people are gonna have some ideas when they come back about different ways to work. We'll be able to figure out what was efficient about our modified um, posture uh, and what we wanna retain going in. But it is important for us to get back together, for us to meet, for us to see each other, um, and for us to have in-person meetings uh, as well. As much as I love talking to you like this, I miss um, getting to meet an ambassador uh, across the lunch table or getting to meet uh, one of our CEOs that may have a question for me. So all of those things um, we miss and uh, we encourage people to get back. Now, with respect to COVID, um, the hospitals in the District of Columbia, are they still sort of filled with COVID patients or not so much now? It's not a problem. Um, we watch uh, kind of proceeding how we go forward in monitoring COVID is to make sure that our public health system can handle um, when people get COVID and get sick. Uh, and we don't want anybody to be in that position. That's why we're so focused on vaccination. Um, so we monitor on a daily basis. Our hospitals report to us and we report to the people of the district how many people we have in the hospital um, with COVID. And right now, only 5.3% of hospital admissions are COVID related. Okay. I was very sorry to read that your sister passed away because of COVID. Uh, not in the Thank District of Columbia, I guess, but uh, she was living, she lives elsewhere or? No, she very much lived in the District, the district of Columbia. District of Columbia, she lived, I'm yeah. sorry, very sorry yeah. for your loss. Um, I wanted to ask you as we wrap up now, um, your daughter, um, does she know what's going on and how does she, she's only three, so how, does, how do you tell her that there's a pandemic going on? I don't think she knows that it's a pandemic. Um, she knows that she has to wear a mask. <laughs> and I think she's gathered um, that I was home a lot more in the evenings because there were no evening meetings. And she may recognize that those things are starting to turn on. And so my schedule is ch changing a little bit. Um, but she gets that she has to wear a mask. Did you get any time off during the pandemic where you can just say, I'm leaving the district or I'm going to go somewhere with masks and nobody can know who I am so I can just relax or you don't get any? Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. No. <laughs> I, had, I had the bright idea to congratulate the new president uh, on the day one and that didn't go over too well. So, um, well, listen, I want to thank you, Mayor, for all that you've been doing uh, during this period of time. And thank you for appearing again with us and uh, enlightening us on what the rules are in the District of Columbia. And I'm going to try to pay off my parking tickets as soon as I can. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks Have a lot. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.